we've been working on a, uh, a project called the uh, Home Farm, which is the area just below the visitor center here in the fields for the past three years. Uh, um, back in 2019, we received an NEH grant, National Endowment for the Humanities, to look at what's called the Home Farm, but it's specifically the Overseer's House that we've known about for a number of years here at Montpelier. And this is all a site that dates to what we call the retirement years of Montpelier. So it, it, as you all know, and it, just to let you know, we're, what I'm gonna be doing with the presentation today is instead, instead of using a PowerPoint, I'm gonna be using uh, GIS. And how many of you all know what GIS is? Any, a few hands there? Well, how many of you all have used uh, Google Maps to look up restaurants? You're using GIS when you do that. So when you go and you use your phone and you zoom into a town and then you look at the restaurants, look at the menu, all that it's information that's uh, geographically based on a map and it's all being pulled from a database that's on the web. And that's exactly what this map is right here. What we've done is um, about starting in 2018 when we flew what's called LIDAR, which is this high resolution terrain, terrain mapping you can get from aerial um, uh, survey, is we started using uh, GIS, Geographic Information Systems, to put all of our information into maps. And if you all know archaeologists, one thing that archaeologists do is map everything. <laughs> and what, what, this, the, what GIS has allowed us to do is do two things, is it's allowed us to have all this information in a central repository, but then also have it on the internet. So the map I'm using today, um, if you all give me your email, uh, I can send you information about how to access these maps and you can go through just reams of information that we've packed into uh, the maps that we have online. So um, uh, for, the, for the property, I um, wanted to give a little bit of a background first about a little bit of history of Montpelier just to refresh everybody's brain on, on, uh, um, on what generation was owning Mont Montpelier when. But Montpelier is a 2,650 la acre landmass that is outlined here in the brown. This is the property boundary. This is what's owned by the National Trust for Historic Preservation today and administered by both the Montpelier Foundation and the Montpelier Descendant Committee today. And Montpelier is, uh, again, it's about um, six miles from Orange. And when you look at the bigger picture here, you've got Monticello down here, Highland. Here's Barbersville. And Montpelier is in this area. And this is all in what's called the Southwest Mountain Chain. And in the early 18th century, when Orange County was, you know, the western part of it was first opening up, this was some of the rich, richest agricultural land in Virginia for, at the time period. And uh, this is all, you know, the Knights of the Golden Horseshoe exploring this area. Taylor family patented the land that makes up the core of Montpelier today, which is this area in gray. This is the original land patent that was taken out by um, uh, um, uh, Francis Madison's father uh, back in 1723. Uh, and by 1732, the Madisons had moved here from the Tidewater and established a site which we today call Mount Pleasant. So um, this is the, the site that's just down at the bottom of the hill uh, where the Madison Family Cemetery is. And of course, the Madison Family Cemetery is there because that's where Amherst Madison, grandfather of the president, is buried. He was uh, he died in, in the fall of, in September of 1732, poisoned by two of his own slaves and a neighboring slave. And uh, after that point, Francis Madison uh, assumes control of the, of the plantation, rightly so, because it was her family's land that was Montpelier. So essentially, this was a Taylor family farm up until her death in 1761. And all during this time, you know, it was, it was uh, um, much like a lot of these plantations are, the main house was, a, was quite a bit smaller. It was a story and a half affair. And what's unusual is that she retains control and the Mount Pleasant serves as the family seat up until 1761. So it was a generational thing. She doesn't pass along really her, her seat as the matriarch until she dies. And that's when James Madison Sr takes over the operation of the plantation and begin, begins the construction of the main house that's up on the hill today. So during this time, what the, the kind of uh, uh, agriculture that's happening here is, of course, tobacco growth. And this was 
This is um, a, uh, the, the, the agricultural technique was more horticulture. It was, uh, instead of using plowing, it was using a hoe and the enslaved would hoe the uh, soil into hills. This caused incre an incredible amount of erosion and depletion of the soils. And this rapidly changed from a plow-based agriculture to when James Madison Sr. takes over the operation of the plantation and begins to build, have the, uh, the main house built, the core of which you can see in this image right here. This is what Montpelier looked like during the Revolutionary War. And during this time, what James Madison Sr. was doing in terms of the economy is he had diversified the plantation. So you, and this is all context for what we're gonna be talking about, which is the home farm, which is the farm complex in the 18 teens. So this is just saying the context for what we're finding out in this area. And it's, it's a, doing archeology span here, you know, as long as we've been doing archeology span here over 35 years, I've been here since 2000, it's incredible how you can begin to see connections between sites, sometimes that are located a mile apart and just be able to build this history for a site that has so few documentary records. I don't know if you all are aware that, uh, probably are, but being here from Orange, that most of the plantation records that were at Montpelier ended up in Gordon, just outside of Gordonsville, at a site called Toddsburg. And this is the home of John Payne Todd, who was the wayward son of James Madison from Dolly's first marriage. When, after Dolly sells the property in 1844, all of the plantation documents end up with John Payne Todd down uh, in Todd's birth. And when he dies in 1852, all of Madison, thesis and nephews come out to his property, find literally two rooms full of documents, decide that Uncle Jimmy wouldn't want anyone prying into his business, take all these out to the back and burn them. So would that go, oh yeah, exactly, the Grumman CF Susie is exactly right, but it still hits me. It, you know, with that when, you know, the plantation books, the garden books, the, the farm books that would have recorded all the crops that have been, been grown here, and of course also all the plats that show where all these buildings and fields are. Mm -hmm. What we're fortunate about Montpelier, however, and I'm gonna jump back to the 18th century in one second and talk about what James Madison Sr. was doing in terms of the agriculture, is that the post-Madison history of Montpelier is one where you go from over 100 enslaved workers living and working here down to about 25 in the, the late Annabelle period. And then after the war, you know, all this area goes into economic depression and there's not a lot of development. And one really special thing about, about Montpelier is the area we're gonna be talking about um, today is here's, and uh, imagine you're on Google Maps here looking at an aerial view of Montpelier. Here's the, uh, uh, the, the main house is, um, is right here as we have um, restored it today. Here's the, uh, the visitor center. We're in the, uh, the grand salon right here. And then the farm complex, this is all where the south yard is. This area right here is what we've reconstructed today is you know, the set of six buildings that we found through the archaeology. And then the farm complex is all this area down in here. So if you visited this area in 1820, what it would have looked like is something like this. And we'll get back to how we have figured this out in one second. So here's the uh, with site of the visitor center today. Main house is back in the woods here. But it was essentially this village of everything, you know, tobacco barns, uh, threshing barn, uh, 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 homes for the enslaved, two blacksmith shops, and then what this looks like today in terms of, you know, its semblance, is you can see, this is basically this, this three-dimensional image here that's computer generated is from the same angle as this drone shot. So it looks very different. And the question is, you know, what happened to all these buildings? Well, when the, when the uh, Madisons, when Dolly Madison sells the property in 1844, one of the really defining aspects that make up Montpelier at that time, she sells as well, which is all of the enslaved community. So by the time the next owner, the Montcures, begin to you know, assume the operations of the estate, you go from 125 enslaved down to about 25, and more than likely, the folks that knew the land that made up Montpelier, all of the, you know, this, at that time, which was 5,000 acres, most of those people are sold. So this is like, you know, 
getting a, a complex set of machinery that you kind of know how to operate and somebody's burned the owner's manual. Because where that owner's manual was is where do you think it was? The brains of the, of the enslaved. Exactly. That, all that information was sold to the South. Information that was passed intergenerationally no longer was passed on. And that's why Montpelier goes into decline. And one really, um, that, that's, a, that's the, really the tragic part of it uh, in terms of the human story. The one tiny bright side of this is in terms of preservation, what happens to this home farm, all this area, this set of, um, this farm complex that, that's in the, uh, in the area of the visitor center today, all this is abandoned. And by the 1850s, where the, where the, the farm complex is set up, is on the opposite side of the property where those of y'all that know where the archaeology lab is and Lewis Hall, all over there. So this is these are all the barns that you know so well, Craig. All you know the long barn and the uh, the farm barn. Most of these, a lot of the, this farm barn, for example, had timbers in it going back to the mid 19th century. Just an incredible structure. So all this is developed by definitely by the time of the Civil War. We've got Civil War um, campsites that are in this area, and also in uh, quarters of the enslaved that are in this area. But all of this area is abandoned. And basically, by the time you get to the Civil War, there is, there, there is only one building that's mentioned as surviving, which is an old tobacco barn, which now we believe is this structure that's down uh, right at the, uh, where, the, where you go up into the field where the Mount Pleasant site is, which is this threshing barn that we found a number of years ago. And um, this one, I, I had a reconstructed picture of this, but it's not in this, in this slide. So all these buildings are gone, and it leads to this incredible preservation. But what, it, what really defines this area in terms of what we found it is that, um, that uh, almost all the buildings that make up this portion of the property date to the late, late 18th century, early 19th century. And this is the time period that James Madison Jr., who at this time in the 18 aughts was, was, was about to, you know, was entering into politics as Secretary of State, you know, uh, with Thomas Jefferson, and then later uh, has his first stint in office in 1808 as president. He begins establishing this area as the main farm complex. Prior to that, you know, when James Madison's parents were doing the agriculture on the, uh, on the estate, um, when, when the house looks something like this, as a, you know, in the time of the American Revolution, um, we're thinking that a lot of the agricultural operations might have been closer to the main house. And so one, one big clue for that is when um, we were doing work on the, uh, on the temple, which is um, right on the north side of the house right here, one thing that we found all around the temple is a massive set of workshops that extend all across this field down in this area. So there's probably a, an acre and a half blacksmith shop down in this area. And what they were producing at that time was really extraordinary because by the time you get to the American Revolution, what, um, what Montpelier has been transformed into, and this is, remember, this is after Francis Madison has passed away, James Madison Sr. and Nellie Conway Madison, his wife, have taken over the operation of the plantation. What they begin to do is to do plow-based agriculture. They're, the, the enslaved are plowing the land. What happens to much of the land is by the time you get to the 1790s, many of the ridges that all, that, like today, what's the landmark forest? All that's been plowed. And it was so badly eroded that by the time you get to the 18 teens, it's all returning to force. And that's why when the trust first acquired the land and you know, was exploring some of these woodlots in this area, gigantic tulip poplar trees. And people assumed, oh, these trees have to you know, be virgin timber that was never touched by man. Well, when we started doing dendro chronology on these trees, what we realized that is that every single ridge top when we did core samples there was not a single tree that dated to before the 1790s. And, or, I'm, I'm sorry, before the 18 teens, which puts the initial growth of some of the hardwood back into the 1790s from where a lot of these areas begin to be abandoned. The only place you get older trees is down in the gullies. And fortunately, because of the timber value, there's a lot of hickory trees that survive. And those are these 
little little sleepers out in the woods. They, they're shade tolerant and will grow very slowly and steadily. And you have a, a hickory that's like about this big around. Some of these are 300 years old, just really tight grain, just amazing. Um, so what? By the time Madison is, you know, preparing for the presidency, but more importantly for Montpelier, is is preparing for retirement here at Montpelier, what he's doing is thinking about Montpelier in terms of the place that he wants to return to. And we, we think ideally he wants to return here by 1812, you know, just do one term as, as president. And then of course, you know, what happens in 1812? You have the War of 1812, and this really puts his main document, the Constitution, under trial. Because you know, to have a war and have wartime occupancy by the British that's where you can devolve into all, all kinds of political mess. So he did, runs into space for another year, another term in office. But what he does beginning in 1808 is he changes his parents' core 18th century house into this much, you know, goes from a Georgian house into the latest neoclassical design with the wings, adding the portico in the 1790s, redoes all the yard, you know, gets rid of all the outbuildings that are in front, and you can see, um, Let's see, 1765. This is what the house looked like in 1765 with these outbuildings that were out front in the blacksmith shop that's over here. Gets rid of the blacksmith shop, gets rid of all the outbuildings that are out front, takes all the workings that are, the working buildings that are in this area and moves them over to where the home farm is today. And one thing that Madison is known for at the time period is he, he's very interested in modernizing Montpelier, not only the appearance of Montpelier and making it into this picturesque landscape that you know is the kind of the latest cutting edge of landscape design and also thought design as well, but he's also interested in scientific farming. And so this is where he and Jefferson are constantly writing letters back and forth about different types of, types of crops that can be used to yield additional yields on the, on the land fertilizing and, 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 and contour plowing. And when you look at how some of these, um, these agricultural practices get activated here at Montpelier, and we've done a, a, a large study of this in the Eastwoods, what you begin to understand is that much of the, the, what happens to the soils in this, in this um, part of, the, of the, the world, you know, they go from uphill to downhill with erosion. And when we did the LIDAR, we got some amazing um, examples of this. Th this is a wooded area of Montpelier right here. And when you look at the, um, at the LIDAR maps right here, this is these high terrain, high, high detail uh, terrain maps. What you can be begin to see is some of these areas that are in the upland portions where you get you know, no trees that predate the 18 teens, you have these areas where you have the, that would have been suitable for plowing, but were directional plowed, and you get this massive set of erosional gullies where all the soil washed from these upland areas down into these valleys. And what we found through metal detector surveys is the buildings that are in these areas, we were finding everything from uh, tobacco barns based on the, the metal detector hits we found that are you know, just nails and areas and no, no tools. But then also, in other locations, we've, um, we've got, uh, there it is right there, we've got threshing barns. For example, this barn that was at the top of the ridge has a threshing tooth, which indicated there was a threshing machine here. So you've got, uh, and this is on the remote parts of the plantation, haven't even got to the home farm yet. And I, one thing I, I need to be keeping to time because the visitor center closes at 4.30 and you all probably have places to go long before that as well. So I want to respect everybody's time. But even in the remote parts of the property, what there's evidence for is Madison is using these latest agricultural techniques to, to really modernize the landscape in terms of how the, how the crops are being produced. And one thing that you know, um, Hillary Hicks noted, this is our senior research historian here at Montpelier, is she, she, she's found records where the Madisons, James Madison writes about you know, selling tobacco into the 1820s. And what he's doing is he's, um, he's uh, storing the crops until the tobacco prices are high. And these tobacco um, yields are some of the only ways he's able to make a profit. 
because you know the, the wheat at the time is being infested by the uh, the the, uh, the, the, the the flies and some of the boll weevils that were occurring at the time. The economy for wheat is in in the uh, in the toilet in terms of the you know the economic the the panic of 1819 and various um, agricultural uh, depre economic depressions that are occurring at this time period. But what Madison's relying on for tobacco is remember tobacco is a very uh, um, nutrient intense crop. So you can't grow tobacco just anywhere on the landscape. The one area you could grow tobacco is areas where you have well-drained soils that are incredibly high in nutrients. And this is where these bottomlands come in because all this topsoil is washing into these bottomlands and then ending up down at the, in what essentially are wetlands. And what we found in the, the, the surveys we've done is in these bottomlands is you find that you've got these, these flat areas where these, you, the streams have been channelized and all this, this lowland has been basically drained so that the kind of trees that are down in here are all dry loving trees. Hickories, tulip poplars, no sycamores whatsoever. And so these areas, even today, are drained by these waterways. Well, the only way to design these kind of, um, these kind of um, uh, basically drainage canals is to either have GIS mapping to see the hydrological flow, which was not available in the 1820s, which when these are when these barns date to, or know the land. And by knowing the land, what I mean by that is knowing where you get the highest rates of flow of water off slopes, where you need to have catchment basin, basins that are, that are catching uh, you know, the flow of water so you don't wash out the, uh, the fields that are planted in tobacco. And the people that are going to know that are the enslaved. So a lot of the design for this comes from the enslaved knowledge of how the land works, where the best soils are, what soils are more susceptible to have wet spots. And Madison is actually writing to his friends about this. He's, he's, he delivers an address to the Albemarle Agricultural Society in 1819. And what he's talking about is the need to conserve land. And during this time, he's writing friends who are also in the society about how to deal with draining bottomlands like this. And one gentleman from Keswick writes back and says that how he manages it is he had, he had his slaves dig drainage canals and then cover them with stones so that it wouldn't receive the erosion and you could actually put soil across those areas and have larger plowed areas, you know, even above the drainway. So basically, you know, put these drainage lines underground. Well, any of you all know that rock, the rocks here in the Piedmont, this part of Orange, you don't get flat rocks like that. It's all the greenstone, it's all chunky. You can barely build a building out of it unless you've got concrete like the DuPont said. Uh, so that what this relies on is, a, is, is ensuring that the capacity of these streams exceeds any load that's coming in from you know, a rainstorm. So long and the short of it, what you've got is a, um, uh, a, a land mass that, you know, the work that's being put into Montpelier in the 1820s isn't, you know, something that can be successfully accomplished by book knowledge. It's successfully accomplished by knowing the land. And the people that know the land are the people that have been here. And when you're, when you're looking at 1820, you're looking at over, you're close to a century of enslaved families being on this land and about five generations of, of, of enslaved who are passing knowledge down from one generation to the next. And as happens in rural societies, if, you're, if your parent is a blacksmith, you're probably going to be a blacksmith. Because you you know you might not have the artistry to make beautiful um, uh, you know artistically rendered say um, uh, sculptures, but through thousands of hours of repetitions, you're going to know how to make nails. You're going to know how to make hinges. You're not you're going to know how to make a plow that can resist the soils we've got here. So you've got generations of knowledge that's passed down, and what we're looking at with all this is an area that uh, when you look at the, um, where we are today, getting back to the topic of the talk, which is the home farm, is we're looking at an area that um, for the Madisons was, was the core of the plantation and the core of you know, what they called 
their home. And th you know, today, what we've got at Montpelier with the visitor center and the main house and the Madison Family Cemetery, we're pretty much in the same kind of, uh, th th this is why this is the historic core and the visitor core today, because it was important back in the early 19th century. And one thing we're exploring with this space is, again, we don't have any maps that show where these buildings are. And what we've done over the past three years is do metal detector surveys to understand everything that's in this area. And um, for those of y'all that have uh, been on, on, the, uh, on our programs, and a number of y'all have, you know what the metal detector surveys are. It's where we invite metal detectorists out for the week. And we actually have one metal detectorist that works with us. And we, we have folks that come out that are interested, you know, most of them have done work on Civil War sites, so they come here and they're thinking, you know, about metal detecting in Montpelier, they're going to be finding buckles and buttons and maybe a few coins, and then we tell them, nope, what we want to do is find nails, and you just hear a collective groan, because that's like nails is what metal detectors usually discard. But once they begin to understand that what nails have that all these other, a lot of these other items don't, is nails are the key to understanding what these buildings are. Because when you think about a building collapsing and being abandoned like this home farm was, what's going to be left is a pile of nails. And what's beautiful about the nails at Montpelier is, is when we did the restoration of the main house, we were able to develop this incredible chronology of dating nails. So basically every 20 years, nail manufacturer changes and fortunately because of the um, the lower acidity of this soil nails preserve well on the ground so you can identify whether it's a hand forged nail like you can see at the top of this illustration that's associated with James Madison the house that James Madison senior arranged to be built whether it's the um, the changes that happened to the house in 1797 when Dolly and James are first married in the wing this this um, duplex is, that is added along with the portico, or the kind of sweet period that we're restoring to, which is the retirement years, you can go and do the metal detector surveys, not only find where the buildings are, but also date the buildings. And how this works is, uh, you might guess, is, GP, is, is, um, is a GIS. So many acronyms archaeologists use. G I just started slipping and saying GPR, which I do want to get into because that's one of the things we've done at the uh, at the overseer's house. But for this area here, we did a survey of this landmass about six years ago with what we call 20 meter survey. And the 20 meter survey is basically doing what this looks like. You grid the property out on 20 meter squares, and a 20 meter square is about a tenth of an acre. It's 66 feet by 66 feet. And the metal detector sweeps each one of these squares and then uh, makes sure that does enough sampling to understand whether they're looking at you know, uh, historic nails like cut or rot nails that date to the 18th and 19th century, or it's a 20th century trash dump because all the way up until the 1960s, where the, there was no landfill, Stuff got dumped out in the woods, so you have to sample to understand what you're finding. And what you've got in, the, in these, these color ranges is the density of historic hits that are in each of these squares. So the red hits are the dense areas, the green are the lower densities, or you know, hardly anything whatsoever. And as you can imagine, what these green areas are, are for the most part agricultural fields. Where the red is, is where you get buildings. And this area right in here, you know, between the main house right here, here's the, uh, the main house going all the way down to the uh, Madison Family Cemetery right here, this is where you basically have an extended area of red. It's an intensively uh, utilized and built up area with a blacksmith shop, you know, making up this edge of it, and then the overseers and the, and the, uh, the, the other blacksmith shop making up this end of it. Now, once you, you do this kind of survey, you understand where the sites are. Well, when we're doing this work, a 20 meter square is pretty doggone large. That's a tenth of an acre, basically the size of a small yard. So what we do is once we find these sites, what we do is we go in and redo the metal detector survey all over again, except do it on a 10 foot interval. And on a 10 foot interval, what you can begin to do is make out where the buildings are. And a really good example of this is in this area, 
grid in here. If I turn off the, the 10 foot grid, what you can see is there's this, basically looks like an extended area of red, this continuous site through this area right here. But when you do the um, look at the 10 foot grid, what you can begin to see is there's about three different sites. You've got this area right here, which when we you know, looked at what we were finding at this site and opened up units, we started finding just all kinds of slag and all kinds of clipped iron. This is the blacksmith site dating to the 18 teens. And I mentioned that the other blacksmith sh shop during the 18th century, during the American Revolution, was over here by the main house um, at the, um, uh, in this spot right here. Let me see if I can click on the right one. Yeah, this, uh, this signage right here, right beside the blacks, right beside the temple, we found this massive deposit of slag, tools, and clipped iron. It was basically a, an acre and a half blacksmith shop that was here. This is basically what allowed Madison to write the Constitution in the 1790s. Because at that time, his father's blacksmith shop was in full production, and when all these other plantations in Orange County and the rest of the Piedmont were going belly up and in debt, Madison's father had the black had had, had the uh, the plantation surviving not not only on export an export based economy of tobacco and grains, but also manufacturing items for the local community, such as producing plows. There's one visitor that talks about visiting Montpelier in the uh, 1790s, and over two days he watched a wagon be built and then be moved off the property to be sold to someone in the community. So. Uh, mul multiple lines of income. What Madison does is, this is the president when he retires, or he's nearing retirement, when he, when he takes over the operation, he closes up this blacksmith shop, and it goes from being a regional blacksmith shop to the blacksmith shop that we have down at the home farm that's basically serving the needs of the plantation. You go, like when we did excavations up at the blacksmith shop by the temple, we're literally finding bar iron that the blacksmiths are getting from a forge and then making into new products. Everything that we found at the blacksmith shop that's by the home farm consists of um, basically clipped iron and there's a lot of horseshoes and other agricultural implements that have been pared down. We literally found a hoe that had been cut up into segments to make something new. At the blacksmith shop by the temple, the Smiths were not wasting their time with a hoe. They were, you know, getting pig iron and making it into new implements. So basically, what what it looks to be, and this and Madison's writing about this in the early 19th century. He's he and Jefferson have the, the have devised these ideas of having, you know, um, a yeoman-based farming in the Piedmont, and eventually want to transition to uh, free whites taking over the agricultural economy, and this is where the colonization society, uh, you know, moving uh, blacks to, uh, to Africa com comes in with some of this, these ideas. But what he's looking at Montpelier as, is as a scientific farm. And remember, the people that know how to make this into a scientific farm are the enslaved farmers who are living and working here. So what we're, one, one of the sites we found in our, in our metal detector survey that really started to really blow us away in terms of the information we were finding is we found one site, this is back in 2011, that we did metal detector survey on that um, turned out to be a threshing barn. But what was in the middle of, the, what was it in amongst this threshing barn was these areas of, um, the, you can see these uh, rectangles Right here, there's a, rectangle, there's a square here, there's another square right here. Inside this one is where we found all these threshing teeth. But these squares consist of charred wood and charred clay in this area. And they fit exactly with what you would do if you, for, for a, um, a heat-cured tobacco bar. Basically, these are the flues for heat-curing tobacco but they're at the, at the ground surface. This building dates to around the 1780s, 
sometime in the 18 teens, it, it, it gets converted into a threshing barn. And so this middle bay is where the threshing machine is installed. And then it's the, the, the perfect example of like a three bay English uh, threshing barn. So by the time you get into, into the early 19th century, it goes from being a tobacco barn to being a threshing barn. When we found this in the early 2000 uh, teens, we thought this kind of exemplified this transition from tobacco to wheat economy that was happening in the Piedmont. But this, this, year, this past year when we were doing a survey, what we found was a, another, um, another site that ju was just right across this colonial road right here that consisted, when we did the surveys of it, uh, we found all these heat signals with doing um, uh, magnetometry work. And when we did excavations, what we found were, th this, this area was always prominent because there were these mounds here and then depressions in the middle. And what we found were the same sort of trenches that were in the ground, except what was different about this is it looked like this barn had been dug into the ground and then the soil was mounded up and then the barn was built on the mounds of soil so you had nearly a subterranean structure. And this is getting into the more modern forms of heat, uh, fl uh, heat flue-based uh, tobacco barns that you see throughout the South today. But what's different about this is there's none of the iron flues that are present in these heat curing tobacco barns today. It's all done with it, with this you know this clay infrastructure, but with it being part of this being subterranean. I we, and if anybody knows of this sort of design, I'd love to see it. I've not seen any designs like this in any books or any surviving barns to this date. And I've talked to a lot of folks that know tobacco barns. This seems to be unique to what we've got here at Montpelier, but this barn was only found through a metal detector survey, and when we did, when the previous archaeologists tested this area, they thought it was a, might have been a brick plant because of the, of the charred soil, and then it was kind of written off because there was no brick whatsoever. But when we did the metal detector survey, that's when all the nails showed up. So these kind of barns kind of fall between the radar for a lot of archaeologists, and being a barn that is basically a log structure all these are gone today. But what this speaks to is, you know, if there's no written examples of this barn, and you know, what survives is the archaeological archaeological example. So there's no documentation or no kind of like, you know, Madison writing to his friends and they're talking about this design and building, like we have with the threshing machine, like the threshing machine. There's a letter that Madison writes to a friend in England and gets the design for the threshing machine from, I can't remember the guy from Scotland, but when he built, has his blacksmith build it, he's immediately writing to Jefferson saying, hey, you gotta see my fixed threshing machine that I've got along with the mobile threshing machine that I built. So these are you know, ideas that are, that are in the, the Anglo domain. This one right here, he's not writing anybody about this bar. So who do you think the ideas of this barn are potentially coming from? The enslaved. The enslaved, yeah. And so, so you're, what we're starting to understand is in this area, and, the, and the, the question about the intellectual contributions of the enslaved, this is something that the descendants have you know, asked us about for the past decade. We, as you all know, we have an exhibit at the main house called the Mere Distinction of Color. And when we were uh, restoring and beginning to build, when Craig was beginning to build the South Yard, um, we had a number of descendants out on digs. And uh, when they learned that what we were going to be doing is rebuilding their ancestors' homes, one of the first questions they had is, you know, how are you going to ensure that when visitors come into our ancestors' homes, they, you know, see our ancestors with the same degree of respect is they, you know, they, they get from Mr. Madison when you enter the main house. So you, get, you go into a typical main house and it's like, no, I need to take that drink from you, no, no flash photography, and then you get out to where the quarters are and it's kind of like, yeah, these are self-guided, do what you want in this space. Well, we started working with the descendants on what kind of exhibit design in this space. And one thing that they asked us is, you know, when you're in the main house, you, you hear about the intellectual contributions of Mr. Madison. And, 
Yeah, you know, obviously those are, are uh, um, were a game changer for this country to say the least in terms of his ideas of political philosophy created a constitution that survived not only civil wars but just you know a multi multiple changes in technology and in economies and the amendment system is one that it's allowed allowed to be a, flex a flexible document. But what they asked us is, what? How can you tell the story of our ancestors' lives and talk about their intellectual lives, who they were as people, not just as as, as drudges who were behind a plow, but what was their intellectual contribution, not only to this landscape but also to this country? And that's when we began to really ask questions in a different way. And a really good example that I like to talk about because it's coming from me and it's not a very good image of me is that when we were doing excavations in the front lawn, uh, this is like about 15, yeah about 12 years ago, we started finding, we were looking for evidence of the fence and how we figured out this fence is one was a, a wonderful uh, watercolor by the Baroness Hyde in Newville that was done in 18, 1818 that showed this fence out front. We did GPR and found where the fence you know, potentially was, started doing excavations, and what we found is where the, when you look inside one of these post holes right here, you get this squared off area that's a four inch by four inch post. And the reason why you can see it so well is before it was installed, the enslaved uh, carpenter that put, built this charred the end of the post. And what do you think that allowed that post to do when it was in the ground? Survive. And why is that? Um, well, that rock. It doesn't rot. Bugs don't like charred wood. So how I used to describe this is Mr. Madison, before the, the enslaved installed the post in the ground, he had the slaves char the post. And how many posts do you think Mr. Madison oversaw when these posts were being put in the ground? And who likely had the knowledge? Madison, when he was writing the Constitution, did not have to worry about a post rotting. He would have had a slave, one of the enslaved carpenters, cut down another black locust tree and install the other one. That was his solution. But if you're one of the enslaved and you're putting in this fence and you know you have a shed load of work to do, you're going to want that fence to survive. And then also, you can hold that knowledge up to you know, your excellence in work. And maybe that's going to be a deciding factor when Madison is selling off individuals and he's thinking, who am I going to make unhappy? Is it going to be the person that I'm relying on, who's the head carpenter that repairs everything and brings the money in, or is it going to be another person? So there's, you know, there's motivation here. No, you know, no enslaved are making money off of doing their work well, but when you think about keeping your family together, you know, making a hundred thousand dollars, you know, today doesn't matter a, a lick compared to keeping your family together. So it's different, you know, no motivations. And this is all getting back to the home farm, I promise. But what, what this all gets to is that, you know, who, who has this knowledge, again, is the enslaved. And then what you've got at the home farm is, you know, this interesting, you know, set of buildings. Everything from, you know, two blacksmith shop, one of which appears to be a farrier, you know, for uh, doing horseshoes, another blacksmith for doing repairing this tobacco and threshing barn, this new tobacco barn that's this unique design, have the homes of the enslaved, which based on the amount of blacksmith material we found in these buildings, probably was where the head blacksmith and other blacksmiths lived. But then over here, you get the overseer's house. And the overseer is, uh, you know, based on the records that we've got from the time period, is about, you know, every, uh, at most, at, at best, every 10 years, you've got a new overseer that's coming in. And when you think about what this overseer's role is, if there, you get a new, every, a, new, a new overseer every five to 10 years, their knowledge of the land is gonna be very, very limited. So, you know, what do you think this overseer's role is gonna be on the plantation? If they're not knowing, you know, even how to, you know, necessarily not just how to char a post, but what kind of wood is the best to char, and whether it's you know 
wood is and wood is, as Greg could tell you, you know, whether it's going to be at the base of the tree, whether it's a limb, you know, dip, seeing out different limb, different types of trees in the area wrapped to different situations. What do you think that overseer is going to be responsible for at this uh, part of the plantation? Finding out who has that knowledge. Hmm? Finding out who has that knowledge. Yeah, that, that, is, that is one thing. And uh, understanding how to manage uh, people. And and because he, the overseer, is, is classically in this kind of situation is the one that's going to be the interme intermediary between the owner and the enslaved. And so they've got to have the trust of the owner, but also a working relationship with the enslaved. And this is where, you know, uh, one thing we're interested in with the overseer's house is, you know, what was um, their relationship to the enslaved, but also to the Madisons? And, you know, what, what kind of image do you have for overseers of the, of the time period? You know, what, is it a positive or a negative one? Negative. negative. What do you usually think about with an overseer? Whip. Hmm? Whip. With, yeah, and, and this was there a mixed bag of good and bad overseers? It depends on your perspective. This is whether it's the perspective of the enslaved or your, the perspective of the owner. And definitely, like during the later years, Dolly was going through an overseer every single year. And from the enslaved perspective, there are multiple accounts in the American South of overseers being found in the field dead and everybody looking the other way. So these are overseers that weren't appreciated by anybody. Um, and so uh, one thing we're interested in is understanding, you know, when you think of a plantation, you know, when mo modern visitors come here and they think about what their role is going to be, you know, in terms of identifying, you know, what group you're identifying with, most people look like the people in this room. White folks, when they arrive, you, you think, okay, you know, who would have been our counterpart? Well, Mr. Madison up in the main house. And we're like, you know, without the overseer, without understanding the broader range of people here, we don't have a place to really begin dis discussing who made up these areas. And with the overseer, what we've got is a way to begin to talk about you know, how does the white population mix in with these plantations of the time period? Because for the enslaved, they would have had a lot of interactions with local whites. There would have been the merchants. They bought all their household items from. They would have sold items in local towns. Like for, for the enslaved, one of their means of uh, making money was growing extra vegetables, having small livestock such as guinea fowl and, um, and chickens for, make, for eggs. So, you know, Dolly, uh, Dolly's nieces talk about going to the quarters and buying eggs and potatoes from the enslaved. And this, they, this would have been a source for a lot of the, uh, a lot of the, the, um, uh, the farm to table, if you will, products of the time period throughout the area. So what we've got with the overseer here at Montpelier is a chance to explore, you know, who were these people? A lot of, you know, the average white person. And when you think about citizenship of the time period, before, say, Jacksonian democracy, what did you need to do to be a citizen to be able to vote and run for office? Own property. Own property. And be, uh, be, look like me, white and a male. And that was, that was the first prerequisite. And then, yeah, exactly own land. And a lot of times the overseers, overseers left either because they weren't managing the property or in the case of um, the uh, Edden, Edden uh, uh, Abram Eddins, he was, he was able to obtain land and then start up his own plantation. So there are many examples of overseers that begin as overseers and then make the step to being a, uh, a plantation owner. And so with that, you know, elevates them to the, you know, the being in that political, uh, political realm of informed citizens and invested in the economy. So one thing we're interested in with the overseer's house is um, really getting at you know what this what what this household looked like you know literally what the house looked like and we've got a clue from this there's an 1844 plat that shows the property right when Dolly Madison is selling it and this is kind of like an advertisement for what's here you got the main house you got the mill and then you have this overseer's house and it's shown with what appears to be chimneys on the side 
And when we did metal, when we did some of the shovel test bits over at uh, this area where the overseer's house is, what we found was a concentration of brick right in the area. Let me see. You got um, yeah, you got a uh, the, um, the the borrow pit right here. You've got a well, a, a, a stone lined well that's right in, in this area. Um, and then in between these, you've got what appears to be a, a brick chimney fall. And when you look at the place of this overseer on the landscape, you know, for the folks that are living in the field quarter, what the overseer is situated between, you know, what, what the, is bracketing this area, you've got the slave quarters and the Madison Family Cemetery where all the Madisons are buried. And then you have the overseer's house. So was this a structure that was situated on this hill overlooking the farm complex in a way so that it was kind of a, um, when you look at this image right here, this is an image from a kind of a bird's eye view from Madison Family Cemetery, looking at the, the uh, quarters here, the visitor centers up in this area. You know, was this a structure that had some of the same kind of features as the main house? Or, you know, was it a log structure like so many of, the, of these other buildings are? The other thing we're interested in looking at with the overseer's house is, you know, what sort, are, are, are there, there's evidence for exchange of items between enslaved households, and in some cases, even the Madison household in terms of shared ceramics. Is there interchange <coughs> happening between the overseer and the enslaved? You know, does this work relationship extend into the domestic relationship. And then really significantly, one of the things we've found in the surveys is, you know, the insurance plat, I've got way too many windows open here, this, ins this, uh, this uh, plat shows the overseer's house kind of be, you know, being by itself, but we know from survey there's a whole raft of buildings in this area. And when we've done the excavations over the overseer's house, one of the things we found is a, uh, a subfloor pit. You know, if you look at this unit right here, here's your red clay, of the red Virginia Piedmont clay, and then you've got this darker brown area right here. This is a classic feature that is what's called a subfloor pit. When we did excavations at the field slave quarters, I'm gonna turn some of this mess off here, let's see, uh, so we can get back to the map. When you look at the field slave quarter right here, this is a log structure, and being a log building, you know, there's no foundation. How we identified the building is from the presence of these little pits that are in the ground, which are called subfloor pits. And these are noted in several um, accounts of the early 19th century as being close to the hearth, because this is where you would have stored your sweet potatoes during the wintertime. I and mean, with sweet potatoes, you need to keep them warm and dry, and that's right by the hearth. So when we find one of these, what do you think we have? A cabin. A cabin, exactly. And the only way a, a pit like this would survive is if it was covered over and protected. Because if, if this was out in the yard, all the edges would wash away and all the ash that's used to store the sweet potatoes would be washed away as well. So in finding what appears to be you know, a feature that usually is associated with essentially a, a log cabin right beside where what, it, what the overseer's house is, what does that suggest there would have been as alongside the overseers? Had, had people of color assistance to the overseer? It, that, exactly. The, the other households were living there who were more than likely enslaved. Right. And you know, what was the relationship there? Was that the head blacksmith? that was living, because you look at where the blacksmith shop is. Kind of like the tenants, if you will. Yeah, exactly. You know, what is, you know, what, what is the, the relationship of buildings? What, we, what can we tell from the artifacts that we're finding? Are they shared households based on common work areas and living areas? All this, you know, what we're getting at is who these people are. Yeah. And what we're getting at is a group of people you know, that don't have the elite status of the Madisons, but are in this in-between zone. And when you think about, you know, a lot of the, um, the, code, the black codes that are put into play in the, in the, late, in the, in the late 17th and early 18th century that prescri prescribe 
that whites and blacks aren't to be married, aren't to live you know, together legally, what's that doing to people? It's setting them apart. It's so that when there's a slave uprising, the elite owners will know who has their back, which is the militia, which are made up of not a bunch of elite slave owners, but yeoman farmers. Yeah. And so, you know, what we're what we're looking at with the folks that are overseers, I don't think I, I don't. There's no indication that o, the job of an overseer is one that's passed down from father to son. It's I don't, it, there's some in, like when you talk to people who have overseers in their family, you know, it's, it's heritage. What we found is there is some embarrassment there. It's not something like my my grandfather was a blacksmith and my great grandfather was a blacksmith. And we have a line of blacksmiths that go. No, it's like I, we have a line of overseers that go back in time. I mean, this just isn't there. And you're dealing with some of the more complex and the the the, the more you know really uh, um, just the what makes up society with the folks that are that are holding these roles and what we're getting to with understanding the role that, that the overseers would have with the enslaved is what makes society tick. And then we're doing this at the home of James Madison who developed the ideas of the Constitution and citizenship. And he's witnessing all these relationships and using the relationship of the overseer to manage the people that he owns to make money. And this is like a tiny model for this entire country. You know, it's what goes into the, into the Confederacy. How the how the Confederacy is you know inspires the yeoman farmers to fight for the elite. You know, it's this heritage that goes back you know hundreds of years. And so you know, it it's significant anywhere, but here at the home of the Constitution, it takes on even more meaning. And one of the things that we're we're trying to do with the excavations and the research questions is getting as much feedback from folks in the community like you all as possible and to understand what kind of questions you all would have of the people that were living here. And one, one, um, one um, uh, really amazing connection that I've been able to make by pure happenstance is I have a friend, uh, Virginia Busby, who was um, my uh, unit partner when I took a field school down at St. Mary's uh, City back in 1988. Well, fast forward 15 years from 88, she marries a guy named John Edmonds. And they come out here five years ago, and up to, we had just gotten the NEH grant, and I was joking with John, you know, there was an Abram Edmonds that was the overseer here. And he was like, well, you know, I've got some family stories of having some connection to Orange, but we're all from Charlottesville. That's too far away. And that's just all, you know, how things, you know, people move when you're know, being local. And uh, so Virginia, who's a, you know, they're both archaeologists, but she, you know, being a mom, she wants to, you know, understand what the connections are. She starts drilling into the Edmonds family history. Interestingly, with these over, you know, the history of overseers, she hits a roadblock around 1860. And you know all the connections are Charlottesville. Well, she starts doing Google searches and finds that the Madison Historical Society has the Edens Family Bible. So she writes to the Historical Society, asks to see if there's any you know notes in the in the cover leaf, and sure enough, there are. And there's a family tree that connects Abram Edens to relatives that she is able to place in Charlottesville in the late 19th century. And so John Eddins, you know, Virginia Busby's um, husband, her kids are the direct descendant from Abram Eddins, who was one of the longest term overseers here at Montpelier from the 18 teens up until 1829 when uh, Nellie Conway Madison dies. He, he has some relationship, a uh, legal relationship with um, Nellie Conway Madison. And when Nellie Conway Madison, this is the mother of the president, when she dies, he disappears off the plantation. He gets his land settled in Orange, gives the rest of his land to his son, and then he's somewhere over in, uh, in, in Swift Run, as where his home is established. So what we're trying to do is 
And this is why I'm so excited to be able to do this with the Orange County Historical Society and the Orange County African American Historical Society, is to see in this list of names you know, that we've got for overseers, you know, between William Dixon, I know who the pain is with Dolly Madison's nephew, um, uh, there's, uh, there's Abram Eddins, 1813, up until 1828, uh, Gideon Gooch, there's the Chapmans, all these overseers, and any folks that would have had connections with overseers, you know, what kind of family history is there? And, you know, some of these, um, the, you know, even if it was overseers that aren't connected with Montpelier, some of these stories and these relationships are going to be the same. And while it's one very <coughs> specific role, in many roles that whites held, you know, in, in society at the time period, it has the potential to reflect, you know, the complexities that were there during the time period. And some of the fluidity that happened between, you know, black people and white people. You know, in, in some ways, when you look at, you know, the interconnectedness of communities, there, there seems to be, you know, in some cases, more connection between blacks and whites in the 18th and 19th century than there is today with the legacy of Jim Crow that's been in this country. And uh, some of that was from the cruelty of slavery because how black people were kept, you know, in their economic and uh, uh, social place was through the color of your, their skin. If you've got dark colored skin and you're walking the streets of Richmond in 1820, you better have your papers or you're gonna be arrested and become property of the state and then sold. That define, helps define what you're gonna be doing in society and what steps you're gonna take or not take. And all this ends with emancipation and that's where you get into some of the, you know, a different change and even more, more horrific relationships between blacks and whites. But, you know, beginning to understand, you know, what, what is it that made an overseer such a despised role between, you know, both whites and blacks? You know, was it, you know, the fact that it was, um, you know, uh, um, in many cases, overseers are the ones that, that owners would blame for the whippings. Like Madison and Jefferson both write letters describing how they are instructing their overseers not to whip slaves. And in so many cases, for years, docents would take that information and when asked, you know, what kind of slave owner was Thomas Jefferson or James Madison? Well, he was a very good owner because he made sure his overseers didn't whip the slaves. Well, if you're selling your slaves, what do you think whipping does to their value? It lessens it. If you've got scars on your back and you're on the auction block and you're stripped to the waist, what does those whip marks show about your attitude? Because you're not compliant. You're non compliant and your value goes down. So, yeah, Madison was a good owner from the standpoint of the value of his property by not having it be whipped, but from the perspective of an enslaved, I mean, there is no good slave owner. For God's sake, I mean, so so it's you know, but the overseer you know is given the blame for this, and so you know it's uh, um, these are all things that when we begin to unpack, you know, it's be, when we can begin to begin to understand some of the differences that have become between you know different parts of society in our in our country today. So, what I'd love to do is you know, we're we're at four or five, so I'm way over time. I'm sorry to open it up for questions. But would love to um, see, you know, what your all's thoughts are about the kind of questions we can be asking. I mean, it's everything from, you know, the architecture of the buildings. Uh, you know, you know, did the overseer actually live in a building with a brick chimney and raised wooden floors and glazed windows? We're, we're starting to find more window glass there than we find anywhere else in the home farm. Also, you know, what kind of ceramics did they have? Were they the same ceramics as, as the enslaved? What kind of personal items we find it? In the quarters of the enslaved, there's a lot of personal items that are potable that you can literally put in your back and walk out the door. Coat buttons that correspond even more valuable to fine clothing that back in the day you wouldn't have to hawk your watch. You could hawk your coat because that was, you know, that you wouldn't, didn't get to give that to the goodwill when it was uh, worn out. You repaired it or sold it to your neighbor. So, you know, what, what are the, the, the material manifestations of wealth? 
what are the material manifestations of connections between households, what kind of house are the Madisons providing this rotating set of overseers to either elevate them on the landscape or put them on an equal footing with the enslaved. And even, you know, what, where is the place of the overseer on the landscape in relationship to all these other buildings? And one thing that we've, we've found is that this, um, uh, when you look at the, um, the place of the, and I've got way too many windows over here, fine, so maybe this one. When you look at where, how this overseer sits on the landscape, this, depending on where the structure is, you can or can't see all the other buildings. And so understanding how it faces, you know, where the activity areas, the overseers are, do they have shared yards with this other building that's here, all kinds of questions. So I'd love to open up the floor to questions that you all might have about the sites or suggestions that you all have. And definitely encourage you all to come visit the site when we're doing excavations. And we're going to begin those excavations in two weeks and then be digging throughout the, uh, the summer into the fall. And hey Matt, uh, have you all explored the potential for, um, in terms of the overseer's house, the potential for uh, reuse or, um, or uh, repurposing, say from an earlier uh, slave quarter mm. to then it being transformed into an overseer's house, potentially? Yeah. The, um, there, we believe the overseer up until 1794 was at the old Mount Pleasant site. Mm -hmm. And the old Mount Pleasant site, I'm going to get your, your question in one second, right? But this, if you look at this image right here, here's the, the Madison's dwelling home from like the 1730s up until 1761 when Francis dies. This kitchen is used from the 1730s all the way up until 1794. And then there's a, and it burns. All, we find the, the, all the household possessions in the cellar of this building when we did the archaeology. We found it was being lived in when it burned. And Hillary found a letter which talks about the overseer's house burning in 1794 and all the, 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 uh, the wool that was being, uh, being um, processed going up in that fire. So the old kitchen was being repurposed as the overseer's house. And then it's after that that you, the overseer's house is just, you know, it's built. Yeah, it, there probably was reason. So there's a precedent for that. that it's, there's, absolutely, there, there's a precedent for that in reuse of buildings. And this is where, you know, James Madison Jr. reorganizing this into a farm complex and moving all the buildings from around the main house out here, like the blacksmith shop, and then having an overseer's house that appears on this insurance, on this plat, you know, that if it was a shack, like a log shack, it probably wouldn't be on this map because none of these other buildings are. I mean, even the threshing barn isn't on this map. And that threshing barn, it was valuable enough that John Payne Todd comes back in the fall, in the fall of 1844 and he's, he's caught by the next owner tearing the threshing machine out and destroying the building to get to it. And we actually found the evidence for this down at the site. It was pretty wild when we compared that up. So this, this is probably, you know, similar to the South Yard being kind of these idealized dwellings, you know, with the looking more like the main house. I'm thinking it might have looked like that, but we got to see. we got to see. I think it's really interesting that, that uh, the, the overseer's house in this context here is, is located adjacent to or within this um, this small industrial functioning space. You know, yeah. it's not off by itself. Mm -hmm. It's not situated, you know, at the, at the top of the hill all by its lonesome. It's, it's right there in the midst of all this other, you know, um, industrial agricultural activity that's taking place here in this section of the, of the property. Yeah, that's where, it, like, we always call this the field quarter, which is such a misnomer because there's like there's two blacksmith shops here, and then all these you know modern, sophisticated agricultural buildings that are in this area. This and I think hard. potentially for for some some role of quality control. Mm -hmm. You know, now obviously you know you've got the master, you know, blacksmiths and craftsmen and the guy, you know, the, the enslaved folks who. 
who know what they're doing in terms of producing this produce and, and this machinery and these elements. But but again, as you were talking about earlier, this 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 overseer kind of functioning in this middling level, yeah. you know, social kind of like a bookkeeper uh, space, mm -hmm. uh, kind of the intermediary between you know upper management and the workforce sees the middle management. So there's there's an element I think potentially of some kind of quality control function. He mm -hmm. may not have necessarily, and, and that may maybe you know could be more perceived than real, but but you know again he's the overseer. He occupies that that office. Yeah, quality or quantity. Certainly. Number of hours worked, ensuring that, yeah, yeah. And how that manifests itself, um, that, that's what we're looking for. And, um, What's going to be your focus this summer from where you are right now? The, the focus this summer is going to be um, with the overseers. If you look, for example, this photo right here, we we this is the we've opened up units all across the overseer's house overseer's house site, and when you look at the map that's right here, all these units are what we showed in that aerial. We have all these features that we found, and what we want to do is begin excavating these. Uh, unfortunately, this part of the property is the only part. This field right here is the only part of the historic core that was plowed in the 20th century. All the rest of this is unplowed. So what we've got in terms of features that we can have you know, really good defining features about whether it's a building or whether it's some kind of trash pit is in these below plow zone features like this subfloor pit right here, um, which I, I showed you a picture of. This feature right here, which is a um, what we think is a, a burrow pit, which would be a source of clay for dobbing up the chimney. But then, once you have a hole in the ground, what do you think people throw there? Trash. Trash. Yeah. So that's that's you know, that's the living dream for archaeologists <laughs> is finding the, finding the trash hole. And then one. Oh my goodness. I um, it was only uh, you. Know, uh, the well here. Have you dug any of those wells? We have not. We found about four wells, and um, the 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 thing about wells is one, it's a it's a obviously a safety hazard. You got to have uh, proper um, uh, equipment to, to dig them. But then also, once you dig into them, you're more likely to find waterlogged materials that need special conservation. So this is something we're, we we want to test this and look at it. And we need to write a grant to try to make sure we be able to properly process the materials coming out of that well. What's cool about the well is, is the only other site that has a well is the main house. All the other quarters that we've found have an adjacent spring that would have been for the, for the enslaved. So it kind of that's marks the house that you have on? That's the overseer's house that has the well. Yeah. About so the family house, the original homestead? Um, there might have been a well with the original for Mount Pleasant. There might be a well, but you know the area we opened up of this uh, at Mount Pleasant is uh, quite small. It's only the area that's right in here, and uh, that was where I was working when we first when I first started here in 2000, and we moved away from here by 2002 with the restoration of the house. And need to move back there sometime before I retire. So. <laughs> Um, I have a question. Um, it sounds like Frances was a woman and her dad, mm. and was I understanding right that her father was killed or murdered? He um, was poisoned by, was well, poisoned. the story and the, and the legal documents are that he was poisoned by two of his slaves. Okay. Um, so could she have been a kinder person? I'm just wondering, as a woman mm -hmm. who is running things, really, it sounds like what you're doing now is looking at the remnants of what this woman left behind, really. Yeah, she's the basis for all of Montpelier. And she she never remarries. And, um, you know, the, and he, she even rewrites her husband's will in uh, with, with the um, with the, with the uh, de deeds that are written for the land in 1737, where she, in her husband's will, James Madison Sr. is to obtain control of the land that he assumes becomes of age in 1741. She writes the deed so that she maintains control of the land until her death. 
And so it changes how that transaction is to take place. And so, you know, this is, you know, 95 degree, 100% humidity musing. When we were digging at Mount Pleasant, we were like, maybe Francis got sick of the old guy and was like, this is Taylor family land and Amber Bruce is a real SOB. You know, maybe, you know, she often, and as often happens, who gets the blame? So her, the enslaved, what's unusual is the enslaved that are held responsible for Ambrose's poisoning are returned to Francis, whipped and returned to Francis. And the neighboring slave is hung. You know, so, you know, it's... it's so yeah, if, no, I'm no, wondering if you're going to uncover anything that's going to turn, help us understand more about that story, how she was and how things were. In her, under her yeah, brain. I can send, I've got, just Chris Passion, I just finished a paper on that, we published. I can send you that. So it was, uh, that, that's an intriguing part of the history. You know, her, especially her wanting to maintain the, uh, the family seat at Mount Pleasant. And then James Madison Sr. would have been uh, in his 40s by the time the main house was built. And he would have been able to build that main house some 20 years before with his wealth. And actually, yeah, so there's a whole interesting history there. That's a whole other uh, topic. So, but yeah, it's a, it's a cool topic. Yeah. Do you have any evidence that any of these overseers were free blacks? Yes. The, 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 the main overseer um, appears to, to, for the records, appear to be white men. But there, there were multiple overseers on the plantation at once because these similar to Montpelier and, and at Montpelier, any plantation that's 5,000 acres is going to be divided up into three or four farms, and the <coughs> farm has its own overseer. And at Montpelier, there's records of, say, Sonny, who is enslaved, being an overseer, and that's one of the, you know, the small number of documents we have. There are undoubtedly other uh, enslaved overseers for the, um, for the smaller farms. Who were promoted, basically. Yeah, who had the, the, the trust and the, um, the uh, you know, to, to, be, to become overseers and had negotiated that role. Yeah. Do you know if any of these overseers traveled and were overseers in other um, plantations or farms? Um, I don't know. It wouldn't be surprising if folks did that. So, you know, you would, you would want to have an overseer that would be uh, recommended. And that's something that would be, um, you know, that kind of specific family research. Would be um, interesting. Yeah, I might point that out. I saw the bar name mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, thank you all for coming.